I believe, friends, that whatever God asks us to do, it's probably for our own good. Do you believe that? Now, sometimes it doesn't always feel that way. We're going through a very short series of three messages to, um, these last three weeks about heart matters. The first one dealt with guard well the edges of your heart, you may recall. Because what comes into your heart flows out of your life. A very simple biblical truth. The second one was, if you want to transform your life, develop an attitude of gratitude. You may remember that. The expression of gratitude brings about a transformation of how we think and how we express Christ's love for us to others. The third one today, whatever God asks us to do, is for our own blessing. And it deals with thanksgiving. But thanksgiving is kind of like Christmas. We look forward to Christmas and all of the things that surround it, being with family at, at Christmas Eve and Christmas Day, exchanging gifts, and then we tag on Jesus somewhere in there. And sometimes we miss the core of the message of the Christmas season. The same can happen with Thanksgiving. Do you believe that? We all can think of dozens of reasons to be thankful for. And we start getting in the mindset of giving thanks. But if I remember correctly, there's two parts to Thanksgiving. There's a thanks and the, and the giving. And the Bible says very clearly that God so loved the world that he gave thanks. Well, he gave his only begotten son, didn't he? So we're going to look at the second half of thanksgiving and the giving aspect for a few minutes today. I had a personal experience when I was a freshman in college. The dean... Um, the dean of our dormitory, one worship, uh, for one evening worship, said, you know, we've been out on a mission trip. We went to, um, we went to a mission in South Dakota, and they're in need of some things. They need some blankets, they need some food, and they need some tools. And he said, I'm wondering if among all of us here today, that we could raise, I believe it was $158. $158. Now you can, you can tell it would spend a few years ago. $158 when I was in college was a lot of money. It was uh, about 30 hours worth of work. So it was a considerable amount. Now, those of you that have had the school experience realize that school is expensive and there's not, not a lot in a the average college student's pockets, except lint, uh, and notes to remember to do your studying. So I listened to his plea. It wasn't a lot that he was asking. And I went back to my dorm room, and God said, you know, you really need to give an offering uh, for this cause. So I reached in my pocket, pulled out my wallet, and I think there was $18, and I don't remember the cents. But I remember it was $18, and I'll say 57 cents. So I went back. He took up the offering the next night. I stuck it in there. And I don't know. It's really strange that I even remember giving the offering. But what I do remember is the joy that I had in doing it afterwards. I thought I'm as broke as a broke college student can get. There wasn't a penny in my wallet. But I knew that something good was going to come from giving that offering. And it's strange that more years than I care to admit, I can even remember that. I've given hundreds, hundreds of offerings since that time. But there's great joy. Uh, the point is there's great joy that comes into a heart when we give. Do you believe that? So if you want more joy, 
you might want to perhaps give a sacrificial gift. There's a, um, there's a second piece that I would just share with you as a kind of a way of introducing this topic. It was earlier than my college days that the pastor was talking about regular giving. And one of the verses that he shared is bring all the tithes into the storehouse that, um, that there may, by, may be meat in my house and prove me now herewith, saith the Lord of hosts. If I will not open unto you the windows of heaven and pour you out a blessing, that there will not be room enough to receive it. You may, you may remember that verse very well from Malachi 3 verse 10. It was a struggle with my young soul as I first heard that verse for the first time because I was working earning $22 a week for my part-time work. And that meant at the hourly rate of $1.10 an hour, I would have to return a sum total of 11 cents an hour. And I can see the chuckle, the smirks on your face and the chuckles like, what's the question? Not a lot of question, but I determined that if God had wanted me to do something, it must be for my own good. And indeed, that check was written out, $2.20. Not a penny more, not a penny less. It said a tithe is 10%. And I claim that promise. And you know what? To this day, God has honored that promise. Never in a fashion of purchasing his blessing, but in a fashion of honoring what he allows me to do with the health and strength that he gives me. So I ask you today, when we look at matters of the heart, is it the amount we give or is it really where our heart is and where our thoughts are and where we center our life on? So I ask you today, if you look at the scripture and you want to know where your heart is, what does the Bible say? Say what? Matthew chapter 6, verse 21. You're paraphrasing that. It says, where your treasure is, there will your heart be, what? Also. I kind of wish it were the other way around. And to a large degree, it is, isn't it, folks? You see, we're very good at giving. We don't have any problem at giving at all. We give to Bank of America for our mortgage. We give to Visa for the ski trip that we went on. We give to MasterCard for our eating out. We give to Time Warner Cable, so we don't have nine channels. We have 264. <laughs> we give to our cell phones because landlines would never do anymore. We need to be connected all over everywhere. We give to the restaurant 50 or $100, depending upon whether it's just out to eat or whether it's our anniversary. We give to the hotel we stay in, something that has three figures, and the list goes on. We're very good at giving, aren't we? You don't mind that at all. Oh, now I've gone from, I'm starting to meddle. I'll get back to scripture here in just a moment. <laughs> I approached a subject this week and I said, this is a real dangerous subject, Lord. Why do you want me to share this? And he said, just be very careful you don't share your own thoughts. I was working on an electrical wiring problem this week and both of those wires carried 110 current. I was very careful as I unscrewed the wire nut and worked on it, put it back together. I will be very careful this morning as well. If you're offended by what I say, talk to me afterwards. I have no idea, friends, what you give to the church. And it's not about money. It's about heart matters and the blessings that the Lord wants 
to give to you. For you see, the heart, <clears throat> as we studied before, is deceitfully wicked, and it's deceitfully selfish. And unless we acknowledge that from the beginning, this message won't make sense. Ellen White has written, There is nothing, save the selfish heart of man, that lives unto itself. Ooh. No bird that cleaves the air, no animal that moves upon the ground, but ministers to some other life. There is no leaf of the forest, no lowly blade of grass, but has its ministry. Every tree or shrub, every leaf pours forth the element of life without which neither man nor animal could live. And man and animal in turn minister to the life of the tree, the shrub, and the leaf. The flowers breathe the fragrance and unfold their beauty in blessing the world, the ocean itself, the source of all our springs of fountains, receives the streams from the land, and it takes to give. The mists ascend from its bosom, fall in showers to water the earth that it might bring forth and bud. The angels of glory find their joy in giving, giving love and tireless watch care to souls that are fallen and unholy. Heavenly beings woo the hearts of man. They bring to this dark world the light from courts above by gentle, patient ministry. They move upon the human spirit to bring the lost into fellowship with Christ that is even closer than they themselves know. What a splendor to have part in the redemption of man. So I ask you today, as we look for just a few minutes together about giving, how is it in your heart? It is even a fact that those who do not claim to have a Christian orientation realize the benefit of giving to humanitarian ways. I read with amazement, um, not that his giving is any better or greater than anyone else, uh, the guy that lives in Omaha, Warren, what's his name? The Oracle of Warren what? Buffett. His annual giving in 2014 was $2.8 billion. I'd like to be able to write a check for that. I'll write it if you can cash it. $2.8 billion. He has dedicated 99% of his wealth to be given to foundations that will help mankind. That's an amazing commitment, isn't it? 99%. Of course, if you're worth $72 billion, 1% of $72 billion still leaves quite a bit of money. So I got it. But he's got a, a healthy perspective that we're put on this earth, not just to benefit ourselves, to help our brothers and sisters in Christ and help our brothers and sisters in the community. It's not about the size of the gift. It's not about the size of the gift. It's about the size of the sacrifice. So I ask you today, as we look at two Bible stories, very briefly, two Bible stories, how is it in your heart and in the area of giving? Just let the Holy Spirit work in your heart. It's between you and the Lord today. You've heard the scripture reading from 1 Kings chapter 7, verse 7 through 24. We're going to look at two stories that you know very well, two stories about widows that will teach us lessons about giving. The first is taken from 1 Kings chapter 17, verses 7 through 24. There we find Elijah the prophet as he's traveling to Zarephath and he comes to the gate of the city and behold, there's a widow woman and she's gathering sticks and he called to her and said in verse 10, fetch me, I pray thee, a little water and a vessel that I may drink. And as he was going, as she was going forth to fetch it, he called to her and said, bring me, I pray thee, a morsel of bread in your hand. And she said, But as the Lord giveth, I have not cake, but a handful of meal in a barrel and a little oil in a cruise. And behold, I'm gathering two sticks, 
that I might go in to dress it for me and my son, that we might eat it, and the Bible says what? And die. I read this story, and I say to myself, what in the world is going on here? What is God trying to do in and through this story? Furthermore, I'm not sure that I would want to be in the prophet's shoes. Because I would think, just from a common sense standpoint, that if God can instruct a prophet, he can also inspire him to know what this lady has or does not have. How is it that God would ask a prophet of an offering of somebody who has so little? There's really... Three individuals in this story. And as you just reflect on this story through these Sabbath hours, any one of these three characters could be the center key object of this story. And there's really three separate stories. We don't have time, but just to touch on each one. You have Elijah the prophet coming to be a blessing to her and saying, I would just like a little water and something to eat. And Elijah said to her, fear not. Go and do as thou hast said, and make me a little cake, and bring it on to me, and after make me uh, a little cake for thee and thy son. For thus saith the Lord of Israel, The barrel of meal shall not waste, neither shall the cruise of oil fail, until the day of the Lord sends rain upon the earth. There, there, there is the test. Will she believe it and do it? Or will she say, there's just enough for me and my son? You can go to my neighbor and somebody else will take care of your needs. How is it? How is it in the heart of the widow who has so little? And she went, the Bible says, and did according to the saying of Elijah. And she and her house did eat many days, and the barrel of oil, the barrel of meal wasted not, neither did the cruise of oil fail, according to the word of the Lord, which he spake by Elijah. Everything that God asks us to do is for our own good. Do you believe it, friends? Do you believe it? Do you believe it? If he's asking us to do something, it must be for our own good. But sometimes there's a test, a test of the human heart that says, I don't see the end of this very well. I have such limited means right now. But if we will by faith, walk by faith and honor God first, the, the windows of heaven will be open. The meal, the meal will not fail. The oil will not cease, and you will be blessed. Do you believe it? Now, I don't understand it. That would be story enough to carry, uh, to carry us forward. But there's a very strange thing that happens, and you heard it in the story already as it's been read. What happens? The lady goes and finds that her son has died. Strange way of blessing, huh? Let's see, Lord, you open the windows of heaven. I've had plenty to eat. You've had plenty to eat. My son has had plenty to eat. We have plenty of oil, but my son has passed away. Sometimes it works that way in life, doesn't it? We're blessed by God, and something something comes into our life that just takes us off center. When you lose a loved one, when you have tragedy happen, it's easy to say, where are you, God? I've just given up everything I had, trusting you to feed your prophet. I just looked and had this miraculous experience. But she remembers. 
in the quietness. She remembers, I know where to go. I'm going to go call Elijah. Of all the people in the Bible I'd like to be, one of them might be to spend time in Elijah's shoes. A fantastic life in walking with the Lord. Of all the people I wouldn't like to be is Elijah in this spot. She comes to Elijah carrying her son, tears in her eyes, and said, Man of God, look, this is my son. He cradles her son in his arms, takes him into the other room, lays his body across the lifeless son, and pleads with the Lord, Lord, give this young boy his life back, that you might be glorified, Lord, not me, but you. And from heaven, as he stretched forth his arms across that lifeless body, God's Spirit poured back into that body, and the boy starts breathing. He tenderly cradles that son in his arms and returns into the other room and places that breathing son into his mother's arms. Wouldn't you have liked to have been there? How is this a matter of a heart? It's God pouring out his blessings, God working in that widow's life. Oh, the story is so filled with so much texture and nuanced. Any one of those, any one of those character is a character to be studied. It's not about the size of the gift. It's about the size of the sacrifice. It's not about your giving to earn God's blessing. It's about God wanting to bless you because your heart is committed to Him. Heart matters, friends. How is it in your heart today? A second widow for just a few moments. Mark chapter 12. Verse 32 through 44 is a wonderful and delightful story. They were all gathered in the sanctuary. They were all gathered in the synagogues, the uppermost uh, rooms for the feasts. The religious leaders of the day came in their long robes, very pretentious. They were ready to receive the offering. And as the offering, uh, as the offering receptacles were placed at the front of the church, they came forward. And the offering containers were such that as you dropped the coin into the offering container, you could hear what kind of metal it was. It was a gold coin. It would have a certain ring to it. If it was a copper coin, you could have a, it would have a certain ring to it. If it was a silver coin, uh, you could hear it ringing through the church. That's an interesting thing, isn't it? You could hear what everybody was putting into the offering. So as the priests came up, they dropped their coins in there. As the dignitaries from the community came up, they dropped their coins in there. <laughs> it's an incredible thing here. I find... I. F- I find a certain delight in the Lord's um, selection in teaching us spiritual lessons. He teaches us about giving by choosing two widows. I don't know why it is. Perhaps it's because they have a, a special spot in their heart towards sensitivity of others a special responding to the Holy Spirit, a gentleman that sometimes we don't have quite as much of, or sometimes we neglect, or sometimes we overlook. But quietly, unpretentiously, she made her way from the side as if not to be noticed to where the offering was, and she dropped into the offering receptacle two mites, which some scholars say were two metal coins. 
that had a distinct ring that was different than any other ring. And everybody in the congregation knew that those were copper coins. But they made heaven ring with the sounds of gladness. For of all the offerings given that day, it was Jesus as he sat over against the treasury and beheld how many people cast money into the treasury, Scripture says, and many that were rich cast in much. But there came a certain poor widow, and she threw in two mites, which make a farthing. And he called unto him his disciples, and saith unto them, Verily I say unto you, that this poor widow has cast in more than all they which have cast into the treasury. For they did cast in of their abundance, but she of her want did cast in all that she had, even all her living. And through the ages, the story is told again and again of that giving. So I ask you, once again, how is it in the matters of your heart? For only you can answer that question. Expanding even beyond the giving of your means, the dollars, the silver, the coins, is the expansion of your time and your talents and your commitment to the Lord Jesus Christ. For those we find easier to give at times, and we have more of. But the giving is a heart matter, that we give that which we give to the Lord, we give not on the basis of quantity, but on the basis of sacrifice. So I ask you this Thanksgiving season to take the next seven or eight or ten days before Thanksgiving. When you sit at the Thanksgiving table, think of all the things you are thankful for and think of the second half. What can you bring as a gift to our Lord Jesus Christ that Sabbath following Thanksgiving that will move the mission and purpose of the church ahead? Because I believe as we do so that you will be blessed. I read with interest great interest, this quote a long time ago. It uses the word reflexive, reflex blessing. I like, the term, uh, I like the term so much it stuck with me. The law of action and reaction. Divine wisdom, it says, has appointed in the plan of salvation the law of action and reaction. There's an action, there's a reaction. There's an action, there's a reaction. I like that making the work of beneficence in all its branches twice blessed. If you give, it's a twice blessing. Twice blessed. He that gives to the needy blesses others and, he, and is blessed himself in a still greater degree. You like that? I like that. Lord, I'm going to give to you but I know the windows of heaven, as I give, you're going to pour out into my life, because I'm emptying my cup a little bit, a greater blessing. Now, I don't know how it is about you. I'm just talking to myself right now. There's selfishness in my heart. The $14, the $3 that I might want to give, I struggle with. I don't know why. The $200 for the phone, I don't have any trouble with. Why is that? I have no idea. It doesn't make sense, does it? But what I do know from life's experience is that every time I pour out into what I think is sacrificial into God's cup, He reaches out in unseen ways. I pour into His cup eight ounces. He takes us 32 ounce pitcher and pours into my cup 32 ounces. 
It's called reflexive blessing. Twice blessed, because when we, when we pour out to bless others, we receive the joy that comes into our help, heart. <clears throat> Let me try that once again. When we pour out of our lives to bless others, we receive the joy of helping others. But to a greater degree, God pours into our life his blessing. Heart matters. So let me ask you, in closing, how is it in your heart with the Lord Jesus Christ in the area of giving to him? For the scripture says in 2 Corinthians chapter 9, verses 6 through 8, if in your heart you will harbor an attitude of gratitude, if you'll return beyond that what you think you, sh you can to the Lord, he will bless as you do so cheerfully. For Corinthians says, but this I say, he which soweth sparingly shall reap sparingly. But he which soweth bountifully shall reap bountifully. Every man according as he purposes in his heart, so let him give, not grudgingly or out of necessity. For God loves a cheerful giver. And God is able to make all grace abound toward you that you always, having all sufficiency in all things, may abound to every good work. He cares for our hearts more than we can care for them ourselves. Let's be cheerful givers as we give thanks to the Lord in tangible ways during this season of year. May the Lord bless us as we do so.